Welcome to the third episode of the Maverick Banking Edge podcast series hosted by P. Venkatesh, Director, Thought Leadership, Maverick Systems. Today, joining him, we have two CX experts, Asuthosh and Annette, joining us for this fascinating conversation around hyperpersonalization for the wealth management space in the banking industry. Annette, if I could go with you, I really wanted to to ask you what made you choose this topic and why do you think this report is relevant at this point in time? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a great question, really. I mean, the, the topic of customer experience is always an important one. That's why we're in business for our customers. And so, you know, the customer experience really never sits still. Customer preferences and expectations change. So we have to evolve the business really to keep up with those expectations. I think that there's, you know, there is research out there that says that, you know, your, your last experience is really the one that uh, customers remember and, and we've got to make sure those are all great experiences. Um, I think that that constantly raises the bar on how the experience is going to be and that really changes how brands need to focus on those expectations and really um, think about not just the competition within their own industry but other industries and what other industries are doing and so i think this is a great time for this report to get out there that you know that's one of the reasons right and i think it's also you know imperative that brands really understand who their customers are what problems they're trying to solve where they are in their journeys so that we can help them you know solve their problems, meet their expectations, meet them where they are, personalize the experience, um, you know, deliver the experience that customers are expecting and desire. So I think this this report will certainly help to uh, point, you know, the readers in that that um, direction without a doubt. Um, You know, expectations for today for the experience are, you know, the experience has to be consistent. It's got to be personalized. It's got to be seamless and frictionless, relevant, timely. And, and I think that this report, again, will really help to deliver on that for uh, for brands today as they read through it and really, um, you know, understand the framework, take it to heart and put it to good use. Very nice. Very nice. And it, see, if I may have to ask you, customer experience has been the focus of many verticals, including banking for a long period of time. But we are not seeing much in action, which has resulted in the customer's delight. Yes. Now, what would be, in your view, the key takeaways from this report for the C-level people to put that into action? Yeah, I think there are um, three, really three key takeaways from this report. I think that in, in, in executives in these companies know this there are challenges in wealth management when it comes to the customer experience right the industry faces challenges in delivering that personalization that um that customers are expecting and part of that is because there are no tailored frameworks and there's complex uh, personas there's issues with data you know privacy and the the journeys are pretty intricate for your uh your for your clients so i think that's really important second part i just mentioned it is is a need for that coherent framework right there is no framework out there and so we need this industry-wide framework um to bridge the gap and to provide individualized financial services that you know that that build trust they deepen the client relationship and they really enhance um, satisfaction and loyalty for uh, for your clients. And then I think the third thing is something that we definitely touch on in this framework too is around the opportunity around hyper-personalization. The industry is really moving toward that and it's really about personalizing experience for each individual client at scale. And so this is, this is a big undertaking, but it also offers significant opportunities um, for an organization to deliver the experience that uh, that customers are expecting. Very nice, very nice again. And uh, Asutosh, if I were to turn to you, see the entire paper is on the intersection of wealth and personalization. And I really wanted to first start with what in your view are the major hurdles, issues and constraints that the wealth management firms face today while implementing personalization? Of course, I mean, um, 
and it in a way already summarized why personalization is a must have now uh, it's no more a good to have um, and despite that as you rightly said we don't see as many implementations right so there have to be some hurdles because of which we don't see them effectively being implemented everywhere um, but it's it's been a fascinating journey over a decade from having a focus on target market to a focus on target segment to a focus on target persona to now a target of one um, so clearly technology is no more a hurdle we have enough and more technologies and platforms available which allow us to actually target a unique individual customer by its triggers motivations behavioral attribute attributes what you will right um, change management is no more a hurdle uh, covid 19 kind of completely destroyed that hurdle if i may use use that um, word um, so the the key hurdles is, that i see um, four of them the first one is very specific to wealth management i mean all those who have been in wealth management would know that the sheer multitude of uh, product customer segment customer persona and journey stage considerations that need to be worked out to figure out uh, for whom to personalize the experience what to personalize and how to personalize uh, that real that complexity comes in when we start talking about all these combinations at once uh, and without a right prioritization and focus it becomes a very inefficient and ineffective exercise and on top of that on the other side there is this challenge of quantifying the impact or outcome from the personalization program so unless we have a dollar outcome in our minds at least in terms of forecast or possibility uh, it's very difficult to marry um, you know a practical aspect of implementation in terms of cost and outcome to the actual uh, road map right so uh, this focus on efficiency and effectiveness isn't possible without one the framework as anit mentioned and also without the visibility into the roi and prioritization and focus and then uh, along with these two there are some tactical challenges like data silos exist across the organization and unless you bring all the functional leadership into the common alignment frame uh, of sorts you know have them aligned on the common uh, impact of the personalization uh, these data silos would be difficult to break and again for that we need quantified ROI visibility or outcome possibility in some way worked out, um, and I feel because of these specific challenges, it's very difficult um, to implement a personalization program. And even if you do, right now the I've seen that the average implementation tenure is around 18 to 24 months, which is such a long tenure that um, it it just becomes ineffective uh, without having these questions answered. Um, that's what I feel. See, Asutosh, then uh, I really need to ask you. And it mentioned that there was no framework ready for use on the one side. And you mentioned there are technology challenges in terms of siloed data, as well as the complexity of dealing with wealthy customers who have their own unique preferences and therefore capturing them has its own challenges. I wanted to ask you, does that framework provide both with regard to how to identify the persona and their uniqueness with regard to high net worth uh, investors, as well as in terms of how to capture the data from siloed systems, almost all the challenges which you mentioned in a way that it is ready and good to go to work with for the CX professionals in wealth management industry. I love the question, PV, because <laughs> the answer is an emphatic yes on all the all the <laughs> questions you raised, right? All the sub questions you raised. Uh, in fact, that's why I highlighted the constraints in as as many details as possible, because yes, the framework does address each and every question you raise and rightly raised. Um, uh, because first things first, our framework helps address the issue of prioritization and focus. You know, when you have these multitudes of product, customer segment, persona, and journey stage combinations at play, uh, our framework gives a very simple business centric, outcome centric model of uh, prioritizing and focusing on very specific products segments personas and journey stages 
which when personalized leverage for personalization will drive the maximum impact um you know so you you will see that when me and anet we talk about this framework we always talk about the impact we always talk about uh real world problem solving rather than you know a good to have let's have personalization right that's that's not our story our story is let's have personalization for a specific outcome uh you know so the first first thing our framework addresses is the priority and focus uh the second thing that our framework also does is um we do recommend that there needs to be a very strong consultative deep dive on persona mapping journey mapping which is you know an essential pre work um uh, but um lot of times you know unless you see uh the possibility or see things at play uh it's difficult to invest or deep dive right so what our framework also does is gives um uh, a sense of mapping uh you know standard baseline based uh, best practice based mapping of ideal personas um ideal journeys um uh, ideal journey stages and considerations uh so that you have something uh, ready made to start playing with uh, and which you can of course deep dive further third we also give you personalization possibilities um you know so we have a framework where we say hey uh rather than you be completely creative with the personalization possibilities ground up will give you certain personalization possibilities which are mapped to personas and when i say personas um i just don't mean the demographic attributes of these personas but rather the behavioral attributes the gender specificities um and a lot more deep dive um you know for coming up with these personalization possibilities and lastly it also gives you a sense of crawl walk run approach to implementation where in we say that implement it in a phased manner where the first phase uh, because it would deliver a quantified outcome it kind of would pay for the subsequent investments on subsequent phases right so it is self sustained once you initiate this um so net net it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a decent model focused on quantified outcome uh with a very deep dive mapping of possibilities to all these specificities uh, product persona um journey stage and so on uh, and lastly data silo um to in a way be specific about the question the question is not whether data silo is a techn technological challenge frankly it is not uh, because we have platforms and technologies that allow for data integration and customer 360 view uh, the challenge is functional alignment in breaking those silos um, you know because a lot of functional leaders for right reasons want to own up the data specific to the functions and not really share it across unless there's merit in doing so and our framework kind of helps visualize how breaking the data silos would uh, align a uh, deliver impact align to the individual kra kpis of the functions uh, you know and then the conversation is easier for any cx leader who's going to talk to a sales leader for example rather than saying hey we are going to improve your cs at an nps here someone's going to say Hey, we are going to improve your AUM. And the moment you talk about AUM, the functional leaders would hear you. Would would you know talk about? Hey, let's do this, right? So so data silos is also a lot about aligning KRA KPIs, which our framework uh, allows for, uh, and you know has structured step by step approach to deliver that. See, Ashutosh, you touched upon many things, and I really think that uh, are you indicating that there is a customer experience playbook? that we have given which will aid not only in the executing ch programs but also culturally making those relevant changes like what uh, ann had mentioned it is a cultural factor which is a very critical factor yes and um, uh, and further asutosh one aspect which you mentioned in the constraint was about the project duration being 18 to 24 months do you think with this framework it will come further down right but well, firstly very rightly summarized pv you know my long answer you kind of summarized succinctly within one or two lines so kudos to you pv uh, yes uh, our framework does address um, or or deliver a sense of cx playbook uh but let me be honest uh, i don't want to be someone saying there's magic at play here uh our, our framework does call out realistic 
um, uh, kind of recommendations on having consultative interventions for deep dive that none of this is possible without the right pre work on journey mapping, persona mapping and so on. Uh, but what we definitely do deliver is, um, you know, a, a step by step approach to achieve this uh, and building a rationale towards the investments that are necessary effort wise or cost wise. Um, and in terms of the duration PV, um, the actual duration has a lot of implications in terms of how, what is the readiness of the organization for the implementation, whether it is in terms of technology, uh, availability of technologies and platforms, or uh, rather a prior investment in those, uh, you know, data quality, data integration, data processing, um, approvals, uh, and whatnot. So there is a lot of pre-work infrastructure, culture, change management, program management wise that needs to happen before one can say personalization can now be implemented. And then depending on the maturity of the organization, the duration would change. Uh, but what we have seen that, you know, with the framework, because we kind of impact the planning, ideation and design phases as well for these programs, uh, we see that the duration can be brought down by 40 to 60 percent. You know, that's that's a possibility that we definitely uh, preempt uh, by, with the use of framework. Um, and and we, in the case illustration that we have documented in the paper, we have shown that how we can actually deliver, you know, close to $1.13 million of AUM within eight to 12, eight to 12 months of implementation. So uh, there is there is definitely a possibility of 40 to 60 percent reduction. So that is a substantive reduction and, and with a one year ROI, it makes it much more worthwhile to look into by the both the business and the technology professionals inside the bank. See, if that be the case, then I will turn to Annette. What would be your own advice on its adoption by the wealth management? Yeah, firms? That I, and this is the same advice that I would give to anybody, and I think it would also directly impact, you know, the 40 to 60 percent reduction um, that Ashutosh was talking about. There really are a couple of key <clears throat> foundational um, factors or elements that have to be in place when you're doing this type of work, right? The, and I'll, I'll just summarize them and I'll, I'll go in a little bit more detail, but we need leadership commitment and alignment and we need a customer centric culture. I think that's really at the core of the of the main things that we need in order to um, get adoption and, 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 and get that reduction in time that uh, Ashutosh is talking about. So if I talk about leadership commitment and alignment, so being a customer-centric organization really takes a commitment from the top down, right? There's a mindset shift, there's a behavior shift in how we do everything, and that commitment is also for investments. You know, it's financial, it's it's human, uh, it's it's any resources and technology. Those kinds of things um, will need the the commitment of of your leadership, right? Um, it also, you know, we're also talking about alignment, and that basically means that we need everybody in the organization, every leader in the organization, to be on. Board, right. We need every every channel, every department, every business unit leader thinking and and doing um, exactly the same thing to build out this um, customer centric organization. And I think also that addresses um, one of the issues that Ashutosh mentioned, which is silos. If we have everybody aligned and working together, a customer centric culture is one that is by definition collaborative. And if everybody's aligned, we're all wanting to share data and information and all working toward, uh, you know, the same goals and the same vision and the same objectives, you know, across the board, across the organization. So I think that's really important. And I, and, you know, I've mentioned a uh, customer centric culture, obviously culture was the second thing that I talked about. And I think that, uh, customer centric is a way to go, right? And and it really means that there's no, there are no discussions, no decisions, no designs without bringing that customer and her voice into into them, right? Without asking how is what we're doing going to impact the customer? How is it going to make her feel? What problems are we going to help her solve? And what value will we create and and deliver for her? So, this is really an a, a essential foundational element in order for. A, everything that we're proposing in this in this report to work and to be adopted. So I think that's a really critical, those are two really critical elements that we've got to consider. So leadership commitment and alignment around the goals and then um, 
uh, building out this uh, customer centric culture and it's very deliberately designed to be that way and and that should make everybody's job easier right if you have a culture that's centered on the customer and and there's never any doubt about why we're doing what we're doing then um, that certainly pushes um, pushes the initiative and pushes this work um, further ahead and and to Ashutosh's point helps to cut that time back to uh, for, by 40 to 60 percent. See, Annette, in which case, you know, if it has those foundational elements of ushering in a customer centric culture, as well as giving a good playbook for you to execute CX program, right. do you think that it is adaptable by other segments of banking, especially retail and corporate as well? Even yes. though this is uh, focused on wealth? Yes, absolutely. It, it, it certainly is. You know, we would tweak some of the things because the, the current report and the current framework are very specific to the wealth management personas. Um, but other than that, you know, we would propose uh, other per personas to help you get started um, and, and certainly would advocate for you to, you know, build out your own personas. But uh, yes, absolutely. To answer your question, yes. Okay, thanks. See, now turning to Asutosh, if uh, Annette has given what should be the C-level agenda to take it forward, what would be your advice to the operational team for managing this framework? Yeah, that's, that's a million dollar question now, right? Because um, uh, implementation is the key. Um, otherwise, it's all talk uh, without uh, achieving nothing. Um, it, it, it starts with the pre-work, uh, PV. I, I strongly advise a huge, huge focus and, and investment time, energy, effort on pre-work. A uh, lot of lot of what Annette mentioned is essential pre-work, you know, building the customer-centric culture, cross-functional alignment, uh, governance, leadership alignment, and, and prioritization uh, of this program. Uh, all of this is essential pre-work, but operationally, uh, there is there are some additional elements to the pre-work which again include consultative interventions on uh, persona mapping, journey mapping, um, uh, ROI mapping, uh, and and visualization or quantification. Um, so so these are essential pre-works because once these are in place, uh, you kind of get to answer a lot of problems to get the leadership aligned, uh, get the budgets approved, get the cross-functional team aligned, and so on. And subsequently, the second part would be. Uh, a sense of cross-functional governance team uh, because this program cannot exist in silo. Uh, the execution could be technology focused, uh, but then inputs to that and, and the outcomes from that need to be uh, worked out collaboratively. That's the key word which Anit uh, also highlighted and gave us, right? So it's a collaborative program um, and hence uh, having a cross-functional governance team uh, with sponsorships and advocates from each individual functions uh, would be a great start because then you would have the people to kind of drive the narrative and agenda that the program works out on. Uh, so essential pre-work would be these two. And then uh, there is data management and platform management. Uh, 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 you know, the the key focus for personalization uh, comes from uh, a customer 360 data view, which is where you would want to bring in data from your siloed systems, whether it is CRM, CMS, Robo advisors, chatbots, uh, you know, marketing automation platform, and what you will, uh, kind of assimilate the data, integrate the data, process the data, possibly use AI, ML analytics, and then put those out into BI, uh, a business intelligence report for management view and dashboards. Uh, so all of this needs a very strong data management and tech and platform management. Uh, so which would be the second pivot or the second pillar for that. And the third often which is missed out in such programs PV is uh, people think that this is a burst intervention that you know you implement it and you're done. Uh, but Annette when she started with, with the conversation she mentioned that uh, we live in a far more dynamic world where things change every now and then uh, which means that this program would be a dynamic program as well that there will be changes based on the changes to the market, to the segment, to the product, to the industry and so on. Uh, so there needs to be a sense of CI, CD, continuous improvement and continuous development built into the program. You know, so as in how the program is implemented and evolves, 
there needs to be a market input, uh, segment input, persona input coming in, uh, factored in, uh, changes to be done and then implemented and the cycle to continue. So CICD being an essential part. Uh, these three pillars, if they are thought through and worked out correctly, um, I, I see no reason why this would lead to quantified outcomes. Uh, quite positive on that. See, that is a, uh, a great framework by itself, Asutosh, the three pillar framework. And I wanted to ask you, I heard there were two fundamental parts. One is the foundational parts, which makes it easier to go through this program. And the second is an operational part, which you do it subsequently. Now, are the, in this framework, does it support both? Does it also support, do you have technology identified which could go to support both the components? Yes, um, it, it, I would say that there would be a possibility for round two where we deep dive on uh, hyper personalization that Anit mentioned and also deep dive on technologies and platforms. But our framework does at the end summarize the platforms and technologies that are available today to help execute or implement uh, all the things that we are uh, listing as possibilities from the framework uh, and also the right way of leveraging all the tech and platforms together. Uh, not to forget that not all technologies and platforms are needed at once to drive the personalization. It depends on the possibilities themselves. Uh, you know, for example, if you're going to talk about the campaign and content personalization, then we don't need uh, as much of um, of, of uh, platform intervention rather than the actual content intervention itself. Um, but but uh, it depends on the possibilities and the priorities and the focuses that we have worked out um, uh, to kind of choose which platforms and technologies need to be worked out. Uh, but to summarize, yes, uh, on one side, there'll be platforms like CRM, CMS, marketing automation, um, uh, CDP, customer data platform for data integration and so on. There'll be technologies like AI, ML, analytics, um, and tools like BI, robot advisors, chatbots, and so on. All of those which are available today, it's just that which ones to use, when and how, uh, which would drive the impact uh, positively. And, and the framework does summarize a uh, lot of what I mentioned in detail at the end. Thanks, Asutosh. You are essentially saying that the industry is all set to go to execute. Yes. The only thing is uh, at, at which level they are in, both with regard to culture as well as the technology platforms for the readiness to go to execute. Very nice. Uh, Asutosh, if it is so critical, uh, Annette, I wanted to ask you, are there some fundamental structural changes that the firms need to do in order to get the full value of going to yeah. implement yeah, absolutely. programs? A absolutely. And I think that one of the keys is one of the things that I mentioned is the culture. You, cu the customer centric culture is really going to be critical to, you know, uh, success in, in implementing any type of uh, customer experience initiative. But I think there are a couple of um, a couple of different ways that we can look at some of the some of the some of these things that are required. Right. So if we step back for a minute and we think about the employees and the employee piece, right, we need to have that that team in place that's going to, you know, execute and and guide the implementation of, you know, use use the data and guide the implementation, use the framework and to, you know, guide the implementation for sure. Um, there are going to be, you know, there's going to be the training and the education and making sure that the employees have the resources and the tools and everything that they need um, to do their jobs and to do them differently because we're going to also need um, the right data to inform how they're going to now, um, you know, interact with customers or inform how the technology, and then again, now you're going to need the right technology as well um, to, to use that, whether it's uh, journey orchestration or it's, it's you know, your communications or whatever it is. So you're going to need, so you're going to need the right people, you're going to need the right data, you're going to need the right tools, you're going to need the right culture, and you're going to need the right 
um, uh, training and education for your employees. You're also going to need, so think about that's the employee piece, and then think about the um, <clears throat> program management piece, right? There are some critical pieces that will fall into that. So you're going to need a change management approach. approach. Um, this is certainly a change for your organization and how you do things, and so you're going to need to identify your change management approach. You're going to need to embrace um, uh, an agile experiment experimental <laughs> experimenting um, and continuous improvement um, environment right I mean this these are all things that are going to have to be okay as you go through and manage this work um, you're going to need a governance a governance structure and the which are you know the committees that will lend oversight and execute and then you're also going to need governance in terms of the operating model what are the people data tools, systems processes that are going to be needed and used to as you go through this transformation and you deliver an, a, an entirely new experience for your customers. You're also going to want to think about the metrics. What are how are we going to measure um, where we are monitoring, you know, overall performance? What does success look like? Right. And how are we going to link this work to business outcomes? This is going to be really an important part of that. And then finally, the last bucket that I would that I would talk about in terms of things that we need to think about as we as we implement this is is obviously our clients or our customers. Right. How are we going to uh, communicate with them? How are we going to train them and teach them and reset expectations because the experience is changing? And so if we're going to change the experience, we need to let them know so that they, they aren't frustrated, that they aren't met with, oh goodness, what things are different than they used to be, right? So let's make sure that we educate and train and communicate with our customers so that their expectations are reset. Anytime we change the experience, we want to reset those expectations, right? So, um, so I think that's an important thing to uh, consider. So so those are sort of three buckets. There's, there's, there, there may be more, but those are sort of three primary buckets of things that we need to focus on as we think about how, what are some of the, you know, structural changes that need to be made in order to um, use and, and implement this framework and be successful at it. Thank you so much, both uh, Annette and uh, Asutosh, for not only being on this podcast but also co-working with us in creating that framework. And uh, I hope the industry benefits from that. And, and I'm really looking forward to getting the first implementation on this framework. Uh, absolutely. Thanks for having us. And, and we've absolutely enjoyed working together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Asutosh, any closing remarks from you? So, so first of all, it was lovely working with um, all of you on the framework, and and I do I do am excited about how the first implementation went and how it goes. Uh, I'm very positive about the outcomes and looking forward. Um, and and uh, yeah, just let us know when that first call comes. <laughs> Most certainly, Asadosh. Most certainly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us.